and will go on YouTube and also on our Instagram channel. So um, let's get started. Hi, Ke hi Kiana. Hi, Garrett. Um, does everybody have their whiskey with them? I have mine. Did you have, do you have your Joe? I have my Joe. I have my Joe, but as you can see, I've been drinking it and I've been stuck at home. So I haven't been able to get back to the office <laughs> to get more. Okay, well, we're gonna talk and sip. So yes. you won't go through your whole stash. And no, I've got, I've got, I got backup. But I know Peter okay. does, as so, you can see. Okay, Natasha's drinking Woodford. Um, Ashley's going to go grab a drink. Hurry up and come back. It is uh, five o'clock. It That's is. That's right. That's Some right. Place here on the East Coast. For all of us socially sequestered people. Yes. <laughs> um, so let me just go. Hi, Brack. Brack is here. Hey, Samara. How are you? Good. Hi, Good. How are you not muted? I'm going to have to mute you. <laughs> he, he cheated. He I self muted. Oh, you self muted. Okay, if you're not muted, everybody, please do mute. Everybody else is muted, I think. Hi, Harlan. Harlan's here. Garrett's drinking Evan Williams. Wayne is here. Oh, great. The gang's all here. All right, so we're going to get started. Um, formal First of all, cheers. Yes. Cheers. Raise a glass. Cheers. Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis. Okay, let's get started. So my name is Samara Riverton, CEO and founder of Black Bourbon Society. This is the first of many cocktail conversations that we will be having. Um, let's go right into um, what our topic is for the day. We are with Peter, is it Guidi? How do I say your last name? Guidi, Guidi, like, Gui, like Guido, but with an I on the end, Guidi. Okay, so we're with Peter Guidi, who is the founder of Joe Lewis Bourbon. That's the bourbon that we're all drinking today. And um, we also have Michael Shore, who is the managing partner of Victory Spirits um, with us as well. And really, you know, this has been pumping up in our chat groups, Joe Lewis Bourbon. We want to know what this is and we want to hear from the founders and hear what the whole concept is and all of that. So, Peter, why don't you start off by saying, how did you even get into the bourbon business and how did you choose Joe Lewis? It's a great story, really. Uh, my wife and I are in the hotel business. We own a, a little seasonal hotel on the coast of Maine. Uh, and for about 60 days a year, uh, people actually visit Maine and go to the beach. And as it turns out, at about 5 o'clock, there's a lot of ladies getting ready for dinner and a lot of guys walking around looking for something to do. And I noticed that, and I began drinking bourbon with them. And, and so I built a bourbon culture at my hotel. Uh, every night at five o'clock, I would always spot three or four guys milling around and I'd ask them if they'd like to come into my office and have a drink of bourbon with me. And over time, it became a thing and people started to buy me things. And one of them bought me the history of bourbon. Now, I love to read about stuff. And as I was reading through the book, I came across Joe Louis Bourbon in 1952. And I thought to myself, well, I know who Joe Louis was. And, you know, I really didn't know a lot about Joe Louis, but I, I knew that, you know, he was an important guy and he'd been a great fighter. And I thought it was curious um, that he'd had a bourbon and that it wasn't out there anymore. And it just seemed to me uh, that that would make sense. And so I started to dig into Joe Louis. Who was he? What did he do? You know, why was he important? And candidly, uh, the more I learned, uh, the more interested I, the more interested I became. And um, over the course of a year, uh, I um, began to understand what an important role uh, Joe Lewis had really played in American history. And, and many of his deeds have been somewhat lost uh, to time. And so I contacted my cousin, who I've done some business with in the past, and, and said, I think that it's important uh, that we look into this. And we found that uh, Joe Lewis actually had a son that was still alive and he'd worked with a licensing company. And so we reached out to them and talked about bringing the bourbon back in, into a production. And everybody thought it would be a great idea. 
And so we, um, we built a brand and we found a, a distillery to build a strategic relationship with. Uh, we created a, a cause marketing program with USA Boxing uh, and the Golden Gloves of America, which is where Joe actually started. And uh, found Michael Shore at Victory Spirits and, and started to run into you. I mean, we contacted you, Samara, nearly a year ago now, it seems. And, and voila, uh, we now are in the bottle and we're ready to go. And, um, and suddenly, um, last Thursday, of course, the world blew up. And today, uh, today we're, um, we're trying something new with digital engagement. I'm so happy uh, to have you as a part of this. And um, really looking forward to answering questions and talking more about the fluid itself, the juice. And, and also maybe a little bit more about what we're trying to do with Joe Lewis's legacy and, and how we intend uh, to bring his values back into the lexicon uh, to inspire a new generation of champions to think about um, the importance of the things he did as they guide themselves forward uh, in their lives. Well, let's talk about that because, you know, behind every bourbon brand, you know, bourbon is all, has to all meet the same requirements. And although they taste differently, they are all made the same way. So what stands out with bourbon is the story behind the brand. So let's talk a little bit more about Joe Lewis, who he was, why he is so special to our world today and also the whiskey world. Uh, yeah. Can you dive a little bit more into who Joe Lewis was? Well, you know, there's, uh, when it comes to our mission statement as a company is to be authentic in everything we do. Uh, and we didn't, arrive, we didn't arrive at that mission statement um, you know, in a moment, right? It was really a result of a lot of research. Um, Joe Lewis was the grandson of American slaves. Um, his family did travel to Detroit during the Great Migration. Um, he, he rose um, from nothing, truly. Uh, and in 1937, uh, when he became world heavyweight champion of the world by beating uh, Max Schmeling, uh, keeping in mind that at that time in history, uh, the heavyweight champion of the world was generally considered the world's greatest athlete. Uh, and the fact that Max Schmeling was German uh, at the time that the Nazis were rising, uh, Joe, Joe became uh, the hero uh, to really all Americans on that night, a crowd of 70,000 people. Uh, but later, Max Schmeling actually talked about riding to the hospital uh, in an ambulance and hearing Joe Lewis's name chanted as he drove in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. And Joe then went on to join the, uh, the military. Uh, he fought nearly 100 fights uh, for the troops, um, many times uh, to crowds where black soldiers uh, weren't even allowed to attend. Um, he was awarded a medal. Uh, and, and of course, he went on to defend the title more than it, longer than any other man. Uh, and then upon his death, uh, Ronald Reagan passed a special law, uh, and he's buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And so I've always been a brand guy, and um, branding is important. You know, means it has to mean something. And for me, uh, it, you know, Joe Louis Bourbon had to stand for much more than a picture on the bottle. Uh, Joe had meant so much uh, to so many uh, that his legacy deserved so much more. And so we, with Michael, uh, have worked hard uh, to try to distill uh, not just the bourbon, but also uh, the things Joe stood for, uh, courage, inspiration, um, you know, the ability to fight against adversity, to stay positive, uh, and really to make a difference to the people in his life and around him. Joe gave away hundreds of thousands of dollars to charity. You know, he was, he was a generous man, and, and he was a decent man. And I mean, one of the things you, you learn about Joe Lewis as a fighter, um, you know, he never, he never stood intimidating over a, a, an opponent who he'd knocked down. He, you know, he, he stood for all the right values. And that's what we want the brand to stand for. And so we donate a dollar of every bottle sold to USA Boxing. And we turn a percent and a half back uh, to the Golden Gloves of America. And if you look into boxing, what you learn is that boxing serves uh, many uh, underserved communities uh, that coaches are doing and programs are doing amazing work. As an example, in Detroit, uh, there's a program called the Downtown Detroit Boxing Gym. They have a 100% high school graduation rate um, and, and they're in a very tough neighborhood. 
and and so they're doing great they're doing great things but it's not just detroit it's tulsa that's atlanta it's cincinnati it's columbus it's cleveland uh boxing programs all over this country um are doing important work and youth programs are require money um coaches require money uh you know it, it takes money to drive these programs uh, and we aim to see to it uh, that those programs receive funding and that it comes in in Joe Lewis's name. And so uh, that's, that's you know, the core of it. Um, not to get to, not to wax too poetically about it, but when I was a young man, my father um, was in the sports apparel business and I worked with my dad uh, for many years. Now, now my dad uh, grew up in an Italian household. His parents were immigrants from Italy. My, my grandparents were never American citizens. And, um, you know, nobody uh, graduated from high school, my dad included. And um, eventually he drove a truck 25 years. And, and when he finally found his way into business and in the sports business, swimming specifically, you know, we as a company, um, we had a, a, a policy really. It was unspoken to a great large extent. But if there were kids on the program who couldn't afford apparel, we always outfitted the kids. And, and we, we did that uh, in a couple of instances in places like the department, uh, D Washington DC Department of Recreation, um, spots where, where you know, money was an issue. And, and dad was always the kind of guy who wanted to see to it that we, we were generous uh, and, and the kids always had the apparel they needed to be happy. And so in some ways, um, you know, this, this um, philosophy is something that's passed down, down to me from my father. And so I, I hope that, you know, we can do justice to my dad. We can do justice to Joe. We can make a, a fantastic bourbon. Uh, we can make a difference in the lives of people around us. And if we do all that, then um, we'll have accomplished our goal. Excellent. Peter, I'm sorry to interrupt, sir, but I think, Peter, one of the things that I think is important for people to understand here is how closely uh, we're working with the family. In fact, uh, Joe, Joe, it's Joe Lewis uh, Barrow Jr. I don't think he's here. He was invited to be here. But, um, you, you know, and it's been really eye-opening for me. I've spent most of my career in media marketing and working with, with different brands. And um, the, 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 the layers of this brand story and the importance of it, uh, especially as Peter referenced, to reach a new generation. Because there are a lot of anyone below 30, they, unless they live in Detroit, <laughs> they... They probably don't, they don't really know, they may know the name, but they don't know who he was or what he stood for. And so here we are in this moment um, where, you know, even this particular moment where America needs a hero. And, and this is what America needed when we were in World War II and facing down Nazi Germany. And he, this is why Joe Lewis earned the, the distinction of being the first African-American national hero, because he was... He was not the first African American athlete to be famous or successful, but he was the first American to be embraced equally by everyone. And his actions were all about embracing everyone. And this was at a time of of uh, really, you know, a bad time of segregation, of Jim Crow. And um, we've, you and I have talked about this mm -hmm. a bunch. Um, in fact, I, I should give you credit because oh, you deserve it. So. Mm -hmm. I shared, uh, I don't know, five, four months ago, maybe, yeah. um, the, the mock-ups or the comps of the, of the product, the bottle. And if you can't see it, I know my home laptop is not a great camera, but there's, a, there's a, an audience in the back of the bottle. Normally, there'd be some brown liquid, but I've been drinking it. Um, and she immediately picked up that, you know, we had had an image of uh, a Madison Square Garden uh, or a Yankee Stadium crowd uh, where, where key fights were happening, and and you pointed out, no one else saw it, including members of our team who you know, showed up, um, said, wait, that was a picture from, only white people could be in the audience, you know, black people couldn't come to the fights, they had to listen to it on the radio, uh, right. and and that became a whole uh, eye-opening exploration for us, uh, but it also ended up with, um, one of the very few images that exist. Of a um, of an integrated audience, which is when he was doing um, World War II um, exhibitions, and he was building the morale of the troops, and so they were black and white, and they were in the audience, and that's what's on the model, and it's because of you. So yeah. I want 
Thank you. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for listening because a lot of brands don't. <laughs> no, not only did we listen, I, I want to I want to also open up a little bit another chapter of this, and then I want we do need to get back and talk about the bourbon because the bourbon yeah, is. We want to talk about the juice. <laughs> we do, we talk about the juice, but but let me just say this is that. And I want to let everybody know a new initiative. I'm, I represent Victory Spirits Development, and we're a, a company that is a, a group of individuals who bring a wealth of experience uh, related to spirits. Most of my um, colleagues are from the spirits industry. I am from the marketing and, and media industry, but I have worked with a lot of brands and, and developed a lot of campaigns over the years. So. The, the significance of this is that as a result of those conversations that we had, uh, and you and I discussed the fact that you were going to head up the, the an, a Joe Lewis Bourbon Advisory Board, right. um, but you've got a, a lot of fish okay. in the frying pan. Yes. <laughs> um, so we, but we've thought about it, and, and, and I reached out to someone, and I have invited him here too, but uh, he may not be on it. His name is Will Wright, and Will is a gentleman that I work with almost 40 years ago, we were both early CNN um, producers. He was actually my superior. Um, and um, he has spent the better part of the last 30 so years of his career really being a leader, in, a thought leader before it was cool uh, in diversity thinking. And for the last 12 years, he just recently retired. He was the manager of diversity and inclus inclusiveness content um, uh, development for NBC Universal. So they created programs to question everything about whether it was the nightly news uh, story, reporters and producers making sure they had a broad uh, range of, of, of voices in the stories, whether it was hiring programs, whether it was um, apprentice programs, uh, a whole level of things. And so um, we, in the course of develop, of researching, uh, I, I brought Will in to help understand and research the story, introduced him to the family, to Jojo, um, to you, and, and we created uh, really a, a brand story that is goes beyond anything that I've ever been involved with in terms of the depth uh, and the, and the, and the you know, Peter, you mentioned the authentic in everything we do, and this does reflect that, but this goes beyond that. I mean, I've learned so much. So what we've done as a result of this, we have we formed uh, an In the Spirit of Diversity Advisory Board, which I'm delighted to let everyone know that Samara is on it, even though she's not running it. Uh, it's being run by Will. Um, and if anyone wants to go to victoryspirits.com slash diversity, you can see some of the other uh, individuals on it. Uh, and it may evolve, but we have, a, we have everyone from Joe Joe, Joe Lewis Barrow Jr., Joe's youngest son, who's instrumental in this brand, uh, to Samara, to myself, uh, a white Jewish 60-year-old from Boston. So, you know, that's diversity in its own way. Um, to a, uh, a candidate who's currently running for mayor of Baltimore, who is the Bernie Sanders of Baltimore, 78-year-old mm -hmm. college professor, author, who's spending the last year of his life immersing himself into one of the most crime-ridden, war-torn cities in America. Um, and I've been there with them on some of those. Um, and, uh, and a number of other people, including uh, Ariel Burnett, who uh, runs the social media team. Um, and she is an um, African-American woman who owns her own agency. And we've partnered uh, on, this, on this brand. Uh, and uh, a woman named Andrea Yorgi, who is um, at the young age of 40, already has the distinction of having been the controller um, for Angel's Envy in its first, uh, in, for three years, including two years before it was acquired by Bacardi in one of the largest acquisitions of a brand in the past decade. And for during that process, and then for a year afterwards. So she knows about building brands from the, from the P&L side and from the profit side. Uh, and that's an incredible perspective to have. And it all comes together on that. So I, I, that's enough about that. But all right, so I want to um, dive into, Peter, I'm going to unmute you. I think you had a little crash over there earlier. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to dive into the vitals behind 
the bourbon. So we get the story, we definitely get the intention and um, the social responsibility behind the brand. I think we've covered all of that really well. Um, but let's dive into what actually this is. So sure. you know, when we get, we get to bourbon and the bourbonites are bourbon geeks. They sure. want to know where it's from, what's the mash bill, how long it's been sitting in a fermentation tank, how long it's aged, all of the above. So let's dive right into the, um, to the vitals of the bourbon itself. So tell me where it's, you know, it's produced. We heard it's produced where, Peter? Sure. Well, it's a, it's a big story, right? Um, so coming back to the beginning, uh, when, we, when we first licensed the brand, we might have known about nothing uh, about getting, about really finding bourbon, distil buying bourbon, distilling bourbon. Uh, it was really um, an afterthought <laughs> that we discovered was the most important part. Fortunately, we ran into Michael and he helped us out. One of the things we realized right off the bat was there was this story about sourced bourbon and there was a lot of agitation as we were reading and researching and people were, con you know, the people were expressing a lot of concern that you know, bourbons were all coming out of the same bourbon factories and that there was you know, no difference except for maybe some blending in the different bourbons and th therefore the authenticity around the bourbon itself was suspect. And, and we, we read about that and we thought about that and we also thought about it in light of the fact that you, know, you can't make four year old bourbon. So if you're gonna get into business and you're gonna produce a bourbon, um, you know, it's not like you can, you, you, know, you can't start a bourbon and start selling it four years later. It just doesn't work from a business perspective. And so we started to look for a third rail, a different way to travel. Um, we wanted to be proud um, of where the bourbon came from. We wanted to be able to tell the distilling story. We might not own the distillery itself, but we wanted to be able to say that we were doing our own mash bills eventually. We wanted to be able to say that we, we understood um, how the bourbon was being made. And we wanted to be able to talk about that and wave that flag loudly and proudly. And so we found a distillery uh, by the name of Davis Valley Distilling. Now, Davis Valley Distilling is in Rural Retreat, Virginia. I'm not sure I knew where it was until I visited it. <laughs> um, but if you think about the map of Virginia, there's a lake that goes far west. And most people don't realize it, but Kentucky was Virginia before it was Kentucky. And had they moved the state line a little bit north, Rural Retreat, Virginia would be in Kentucky. It sits high in the Blue Hills. Uh, they've got a fantastic water source, a 3,000 foot deep well that pulls a beautiful limestone water out of the ground. And so from a water perspective, you really couldn't ask for a better, a better water. And from a climate perspective, it's in Virginia, but it might as well be Kentucky. Now, um, the, the, the distilling process itself is very much a craft distilling process. It's a pot, pot, pot still process. Uh, and and they, we do use a non-GMO corn locally sourced. The government doesn't think that's very important, so you can't put it on the label, but there are a lot of people who care about that. Um, the mash bill itself is 65% corn, which is a bit of a high corn content. Um, we, we, you know, we wanted a sweeter bourbon. Uh, we wanted something that, that was maybe a, a, little bit, a little bit sweeter on the tongue coming in. Uh, it's 15% rye, but what's a little bit unique about it uh, is it's 20% barley. Now, that's a bit higher than what you see in most bourbons. And, and to my taste, to my palate, what that does is it smooths the bourbon out on the back end quite a bit. Um, I, I, when, I, when I drink this bourbon, uh, it comes in uh, with a lot of flavor. Um, it tends to be a little sweet, uh, and the rye comes up a little bit high on the palate, and then it's very smooth. Um, on the on the taste, and we 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 did proof it down uh, to ninety um, to ninety proof. We we tried we tasted it at eighty five. We thought it was too flat on the back. Uh, we tried it at ninety five. We thought it came in a little bit hot. Uh, we were looking for a, an everyday drinker, something that was easy to approach. It is a two year bourbon, uh, so it is a bit young um, for those of us who might. Um, you know, enjoy, you know, fours and sixes and eights, but that's you know, kind of... the straight bourbon, the straight bourbon is, you know, Give us maybe, two years. <laughs> excuse me. Give us two years and we'll have Give us a couple of years. But in reality that we wanted, you know, we, we wanted to have a, a, a drink that was easy to drink, that was tasty, 
um, that, that, you know, that wasn't too hot up front. For instance, a lot of the higher proof bourbons, I think you've got to have a more of an acquired taste for bourbon to really enjoy that. And, and I sure do. I, you know, and for me personally, I, I like drinking weeded bourbons, maybe a little bit more than rye. Um, and I tend to like, you know, single barrels and cast strength barrel, you know, cast strength barrel. But, you know, for, for the everyday, for the everyday drinker, um, we wanted to make sure we had a, a, you know, an easy, easy, easy to approach bourbon that people could select on a day-to-day -day basis. We didn't want it to be terribly expensive. You know, um, you can't really compete with Wild Turkey 101. I mean, it's impossible. You know, they, you know, they've owned their, their stills for, you know, a hundred years. You can't compete with those guys on a price point. So we came in at $39.95, trying to keep it at the low end of the premium bourbon scale, uh, make it a little bit unique because we think we think it is a, a little bit a little bit unique, particularly with the barley on the end of it. Um, and um, you know, for the folks who have been, we've had uh, probably maybe five or six cases in circulation amongst close friends and family and, and, and bourbon drinkers. And so far, you know, people have enjoyed it. I've got a lot of positive comments. You know, but when I when I watch uh, YouTube with all the bourbon drinking, you know, crowd, this I, is the sound I, of my drum roll. Well, I mean, I, I've seen we guys. Have to pour, ask, we have to ask Samara because she I saw her. a guy pour a bottle of Blanton's down the drain the other day online. No, 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 so. But we have to ask Samara because she tasted it. Well, yes. So I was just waiting for my turn, but I definitely have done my tasting notes on this, and I'm going to pour myself a little bit more so I can add to um, the notes that I already have, but. Just agreeing with everything that um, Peter was saying, I definitely tasted the corn. The corn in the malt comes from the barley, comes straight out of the out of the bottle, like just whipping it. You get totally that malty smell, that the corn smell. Um, it just comes straight out of the straight out of the bottle. Um, but you know, looking at the color, the way that we review whiskeys is we review it in five different categories. Um, the bourbonites kind of know this, especially the ones that listen to our podcast. So we always look at color, nose, taste, mouthfeel, and the finish. So just looking at the color of this, I know I've, it's, the lighting is weird in here because we have so many windows, but this is a light amber golden color. And again, the nose, the nose nose that I have is at first, at first whiff, it's got some lacquer on it, but lots of corn, malty. Um, once it sits for a little bit, get some air into it, um, you can definitely start to pick up some of the baking spices and a little bit of the caramel that's in there as well. You get some of that, um, those notes. Armand, um, he's on a conference, he's on his own conference call, but um, he um, was able to pick up some pine, some cedar notes. So we've got a little bit of the barrel in there as well um, that just comes off of the nose. Um, with the taste, I'm going to take my sip. <laughs> with the taste it's 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 a very light caramel notes a lot of caramel notes on this um you do pick up the corn but it's not overpowering for it to be 60 percent corn um it doesn't read as like like a dickle that's like hot buttered popcorn or something this one is more mellowed and smooth it definitely has um caramel notes a little bit of citrus in there too as well as some spice. Um, and I, that's totally from that 15% rise that's there. Um, as it starts to kind of wash through the palate to the back, you pick up some, um, some white pepper notes as well. The mouthfeel for me, and again, as Peter said, this is a two year bourbon. So we can't, we should not compare this to a Blanton's or anything that is, you know, 10 years or plus age. But um, the, the mouthfeel is very thin. It washes easily against the palate, um, but it's not, it doesn't have a bite to it. There's nothing bite, there's, no, there's nothing bitey, there's nothing astringent to it. Tears, Michael. Um, there's nothing astringent <laughs> to this at all. It just washes through on the palate very, very easily to the finish, which is short and sweet. So I, I agree with you, Peter. Um, it's very mellow. Um, and I do believe, like you said, I do think it's the amount of um, barley that's in there that keeps it very light and fresh. There's a of couple of other, there's a couple of other elements of this that are worth pointing out. Peter referenced the, that it's in pot stills. Mm -hmm. And, it, and the, um, uh, the distiller, the master distiller insists on um, 
only using the heart. So the heads and the tails, the top and the bottom is discarded. Um, this is, there are very few brands that do that, especially in, in this price point. Um, most of the brands that are, that are straight bourbon on the market are done in column stills. Those are what you see when you go into the distilleries and there the, the, are all these tiers and layers. And so everything gets circulated and, and blended, right? And nothing, nothing is left out. But when you're, when you're doing it in a pot still, on, we have pictures of it on the um, website. Uh, and these are large, you know, 2,500 gallon pot stills. So it's, don't be misled and think that it's like someone's, you know, stirring a little thing. But, um, you know, and, and discarding the heads and tails is very significant because there's a lot of, there's a high, higher level of like acetone. Yeah. Uh, the you know, and this really, yeah. this is a critical, this, what this does, so this drinks, you know, we're talking, we're, we've been talking about two year, like we're making apologies, but this drinks more like a four year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have had the four year. Yeah, I do. I, so I gave you a small, uh, uh, the, the bourbon bond sample. That's, I do. I need to go pull it. I have to walk away to go grab it. It's yeah. over here. <laughs> okay. But yeah. But you remember uh, when you had, have you tasted it? Oh yes, no, it's good. It's it's just as delicious. It's a little more bolder. Like yeah. I think it's great. And even for this, like this is a great everyday sipper. Like right. you guys said, I I enjoy these notes, and I really enjoy that it's very light on the palate. It's not heavy at all, which makes it a very good daily sipper. Um, we've got a couple of questions that are like literally rolling in, so I want to make sure we acknowledge these. Um, and I can answer them. I just saw them. Yes, the barrels that are so used. The barrels are made in South Carolina at Blackwater okay. Barrels, which is in Bamberg, South Carolina, um, which is relevant because it's a very impoverished area. So they're creating jobs. Uh, but they are char free. Uh, obviously, it's new American oak. Um, it is um, the pine either is from North Carolina or Michigan, depending on the time of the year. Um, and they have their own stave mill. Um, that they uh, prepare it. Um, and so it's a char three, which is a medium char. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking at, and I don't want to speak, I'd be ahead of my skis on this, but as some, we're looking at some ideas because we're, we've also been experimenting with um, like, like the makers for like additional staves to finish. Right. Uh, I know you did a video about that earlier today. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I, and I, I've, I've been to the, um, makers distillery and saw that whole process and that kind of inspired us to investigate some things but, but we're not doing that yet so um, so yeah it's a it's a it's a char three uh, I think as Peter referenced um, the uh, the Rick house which is in Virginia um, and I researched this I pulled the um, all the climate maps and I also pulled the USGS water table research to, to determine this um, but the the um, the latitude and longitude, there's about a, a three degree variance from Lexington, Kentucky to rural retreat, Virginia, uh, you know, literally plus or minus three degrees every season. So the durations of the season are the same. Um, so there's, there's no difference there. And, and the limestone um, content in the water, I know we referenced this, but is actually, there's a strain of, uh, of rock uh, that, literally is just outside of the Kentucky border. It runs, I would guess, like northwest to slightly, um, no, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, northwest to slightly southeast, and it runs right through where the distillery is, and it's actually got a higher um, content of limestone than Kentucky water, so it's slightly higher, and that actually is, for those of you who know the water content, it's a higher calcium, uh, that's what leads to the clarity of the bourbon. Of course, there's you know filtration, but the natural clarity comes from a higher limestone um, content. So that's that's pretty significant. And and you know this is a long way of saying um, that this was not this is not ordinary bourbon. Um, and it is you know it it is there are versions of this that are going to be appearing in other brands, but. Um, this brand is really going to be the dominant uh, driver of that. You know, and um, I would just say that it's been now a couple of minutes since we've had a taste, Samara. <laughs> I have pepper. I have pepper. 
Mm-hmm. By the to way, me, Peppa is that means pepper. In that's Maine. pepper, or pepper. And, <laughs> I'm I'm from Maine, Peppa. <laughs> so, but that that's what I have. That's what I have in my mouth right now is a yeah. very peppery, very peppery feel, which works for me a lot. I mean, I that's that's right in my flavor. That's right in my flavor. I like that that heat. You like you know, it to dance right here on the top of your mouth. Yeah, it's right yeah. there. I All right, I like that questions. a lot about it. it. To me, to me, that's Can I where the flow's magic questions? is. Um, the challenge right now, Flo, is that uh, this launches uh, over the next two weeks in Michigan as the first market, and we have had a very deliberate um, rollout strategy that was tied to the state Golden Gloves tournaments in states because the marketing, we have a, as we mentioned earlier, the, the um, JJ and Peter have done an exceptional job in forging an alliance uh, as part of the cause marketing and sports marketing aspect of this. They're, they're, we're, it's a give back to Golden Gloves and USA Boxing. So the, the original plan, which got changed last week, uh, the original plan was to roll out in markets timed to these events and that the bourbon would first appear at the Michigan State Championships, which were supposed to be on April 17th and 18th. Uh, and we were gonna do a preview event at the Detroit Shipping Company, which is like the Detroit equivalent of Ponce Market, I guess on a smaller scale, on the 14th. Well, that place is shuttered uh, and the events have been moved. So we're, we're moving to a um, this, to a digital activation. Uh, and we've been really uh, very fortunate to have a lot of early uh, interest and awareness. So the answer to your question is, um, when will Flo? Where do you are you now? Are you in Georgia or somewhere? Flo's well, in North Carolina. She's North in Charlotte. Carolina. Um, probably not till next year. But the, here's the big but: we've spent most of the day trying to how do we accelerate the direct to consumer shipping, and so is every other brand. Um, so over the next uh, couple of weeks, I imagine there'll be some availability of this product in place, you know, from sources that you could order for shipping. Um, but it will be in, it will be in Michigan as of two weeks from now. Uh, and then Peter, do we want to say where it's going next? Well, so the plan had been on Nevada, uh, right. you know, I don't It'll know. be launched at Caesars in April, but they're closed. You know, C- Caesars Palace, of course, there's a Joe Lewis, like Joe Lewis's legacy inside of Caesars Palace is pretty significant. We were out there a week or so ago. It was crowded, unlike tonight. Um, and, and so we were headed towards Nevada, but given the set of circumstances, uh, we've really moved Q3 forward. And so, uh, next steps will be into New England, uh, and then probably to Florida, but we have been successful in negotiating a relationship with a national distribution company that would give us presence in 40 States. And candidly, it'll depend to some extent on the success of the brand in Michigan. If the brand does what it's supposed to do in Michigan, then, you know, it is all about money at the end of the day. Uh, You know, if if the product sells through and the distributor sees the opportunity, they'll seize it and they'll move it quickly. I know Uh, that, I know that JJ is on the call and JJ is the uh, co-founder and CEO, and he's really the one who's going to make this decision. So I'm going to, I'm going to tee something up. What if we um, sent to Samara, like, a case uh, or a couple more sample bottles that she could then do a some figure it out a way for people to earn um, getting a bottle uh, or win it or something um, because you know we'd have to be we have to be careful it can't be uh, a pay to play kind of thing uh, it literally has to be samples and samples are technically not supposed to be shipped direct to consumers they're supposed to be shipped to commercial addresses. So we have to don't tell anybody, Michael. We'll figure it out. We, you know, we cannot ship alcohol legally, but alcohol, but olive oil and barbecue sauce make it quite safely across the country. Yes. So um, (laughs) (laughs) that's right. We'll figure it out. Um, We don't have to put that on. God God forbid we ship somebody bourbon. Yeah. You know, this is supposed to go on the public airwaves and social media, so we shouldn't die. No, but we're like, we nobody, from, nobody from the TTBs can be tuning in. They're too busy trying to count the excise tax that they're losing. So, 
That's oh, God. True. Um, okay, so Flo made another statement, since he was a veteran and so am I, using us could be another way of including those who sometimes get yeah. what's left. I'm sure some vets will be willing to be brand ambassadors. Um, that's a really good question. I have that question as far as veterans being um, brand ambassadors, but also are you tying in with any um, boxing celebrities to be brand yeah. ambassadors of uh, Joe Louis Bourbon as well? Yeah, we are. Um, we sure are. Uh, keep in mind, though, you know that that. How do you say this? So uh, uh, there's a there's a real distinction between amateur boxing and professional boxing. Uh, amateur boxing um, is really about youth development, you know, and, and and candidly, those kids fight three rounds. They, you know, it's all on points. They've got headgear. Uh, professional boxing, professional boxing is is a rough sport and um, we've, we've um, spent a lot of time with a lot of well-known professional boxers and there's also a tremendous amount of money uh, flowing around professional boxing. So we want to be careful, we want to be careful as we approach professional boxing um, because our focus is really youth programming and youth programming and professional boxing are really two very different things. Um, as in, uh, we men I mentioned earlier, the Detroit Boxing Pro, downtown boxing gym, it's really a literacy program built around the boxing program. Our focus, our focus is really the kids. Yeah. That's really where we're at. Now, having said that, there are a bunch of really excellent young men and women who are amateur boxers, um, who are trying to decide what their next move is in life. And some of them are thinking about going into professional boxing, but you know, not all of them. And we're, we're talking with them. And for those of them that make the move to professional boxing, we probably are not going to bring them in as ambassadors, but the kids who stay amateur and, and are stay involved in the sport as amateurs are probably the ones we're likely to focus on um, you know, professional boxing, if you talk to the folks at USA Boxing, they don't have a lot of good things to say about professional boxing. <laughs> okay, I get it. I get what you're saying here. Yeah. And, and we'll leave it at that. I yeah. want to make sure that I ask any other questions. Jesse asked when it's coming to California. We answered Wayne's. It's coming to Michigan in two weeks. Um, we got the tar levels done. Any other questions, Bourbonites, that are floating out there? Uh, Florida is the next question. And I have some final questions as well. Yeah, Fl Florida, is de Florida is definitely third quarter 2020. We will be in Florida. We, we, we already have distribution lined up. We will switch gears. As soon as it starts to get cold in the Northeast, we'll be working in Florida. And we're also going to try to do Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta. Georgia as well. Yeah. So let's, let's, you know, we're wrapping up. I want these things to go longer than an hour. So we've got a couple more minutes left. Um, a couple of questions that I had. Do you plan on ever opening a distillery and distilling your own product for Joe Louis Bourbon? Boy, we'd love to. Um, you know, when, when we first got into it, um, we really want we really want to build a distillery in Detroit. We want the distillery to be a museum. Um, we want it to be the Joe Lewis experience. Um, there's a lot of Joe Lewis memorabilia, historical stuff still floating around. Um, we, we really, we, we really, really would love to do that. You know, it's, it's a five or $6 million deal. And, and so, um, you know, it's a little beyond our financial resources today to be serious about it. But boy, oh boy, if we had a chance, if we had a chance to do that, we would be quick to it. We talked to the folks at the Packard factory. I, if, I don't know if there's anybody here from Detroit, uh, but there's, um, there was a, um, there's a, um, an old, um, was the, the steam plant. It's got a big, big smokestack and whatnot on it. And we talked to them about getting that as a distillery and having it be the Joe Lewis experience. And, um, we would, geez, we'd love to do it. You know, we really would love to do it. But 
it's expensive yeah. and the money one, is one paid. interim one interim uh, uh, measure might be so Joe Lewis's Southern Kitchen is a restaurant concept that uh, the family and the, and the, and the is is spearheading and it was actually supposed to open this month so all the restaurants and bars closed so I don't know we were actually as you know we talked about we were going to we still may right. uh, do an event there in May because Joe's birthday is may 13th and um we were going to do it that friday night of that week uh, uh you know kind of an appreciation of that with you guys with blackbird and invite all the members in michigan out there at this Detroit. point we don't you know we don't know what's going to happen with when it's reopening but there has also been discussion of creating um you know kind of like a it's a show a show distillery like a, a you know some barrels and some right you know, some sort of experience tied in with the restaurant. Uh, yeah. they, they want to do that. Um, so that may happen as an interim step before it's really produced there. Um, and, uh, you know, because that's going to be a cool thing. And I was having this conversation with, uh, with Jojo a couple, maybe a month ago, um, just trying to really understand, you know, why a restaurant? And he said to me, he said, my father, believed that food and drink were the were what 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 brought everyone together it was it was every every momentous occasion in in a lot in a in a life of an individual or a family involves food and drink and he always felt that that was the great equalizer and to have something that people can you know come to celebrate and also come to just be together so the concept of the restaurant is really more like a Southern, because Joe was born in Alabama, and then he, they, you know, the family moved to Detroit right, after right. he grew up. So right, there's right. their Southern roots. So it's really going to be like a, you know, a comfort food, uh, you know, uh, chicken and waffles. I've got the menu somewhere here, I, uh, the draft menu. But, um, and it's at a there's a there's a restaurant that had existed in Detroit that was either at or near the location that it was was the original Detroit boxing gym where Joe as a teenager went to start his career and so that other this restaurant is going into that same location and that restaurant uh which is now closed uh had been famous for many years and I, I'm blanking on the name if you're from Detroit you may uh, uh I'll have to because Wayne's from Detroit it was <laughs> I'll, 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 it. <laughs> I don't remember. So, um, but anyway, they were famous for some certain, like a chicken and waffles recipe and a few things. So they're bringing those recipes back, but then they're building out this whole concept of it feeling like you're sitting on the, the front porch on a summer evening in the South in right. downtown Detroit. Um, right. So it'd be cool to do that. And they are going to, they're opening first, well, when they open, they're opening first as a breakfast and lunch. And then that date in May that we were talking about was going to be their first uh, evening dinner bar service. The grand opening, right. Yeah, the grand opening was gonna be that. So we don't know what's gonna happen with that now, but. One final question, and is there going to be any additional expressions of Joe Lewis bourbon? Oh, yes. Thank mm -hmm. you, Th thank you, thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Um, Joe Lewis bourbon, uh, Joe Lewis Distilling is not going to be a one-trick pony. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, we have a variety of uh, product concepts coming together, uh, not the least of which um, will be a maple-infused bourbon uh, that will have the color of a Myers dark rum, uh, designed to really be um, a sweet, um, bourbon that, that can, can really capture that drink palette for folks who are enjoying a sweeter taste. A very dark. We will have, um, we will produce a rye. Uh, we will produce a whiskey. Uh, we will produce um, small batches uh, and single and cask offerings. Now the interesting part here is this. Joe Lewis fought 69 fights. And each one of those fights has a unique story, very unique. The Max Schmeling, we talked about the Max Schmeling fights. 
Um, and, and so, um, you know, very unique, unique stories. He actually fought a Canadian guy called the Fighting Fisherman. I mean, the Fighting Fisherman, really? And, and, and so what a cool package that will be. And, and so we pl our plan really is to, to release on a regular basis, um, you know, limited, limited editions built around, Joe's, yeah, built around Joe's fights and build a marketing story around each and every single one of them and, and have some fun with it. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I mean, I don't know about the rest of your audience tonight, but for me, uh, the biggest part of having a collection of bourbon is opening a new bottle with friends. I love opening a new bottle with my buddies. Yeah, you know, that's the best part. Together. Right. I mean, I have a bottle of Blade and Bow uh, <laughs> that was sent to me by a friend. I'm turning 60 on May 18th. And that bottle of Blade and Bros get, getting opened with a bunch of buddies on my 60th birthday. I'm excited about that. <laughs> and, and, so, and so that's really where we're going with this. We, we want to create, um, create stories and experiences with unique bourbons where you, know, you can get together with friends and family and, and, and all of the essence of what we do with America's Best Spirit. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, we plan on building a brand that has enduring value, uh, that continually brings new product to the marketplace uh, and being a part of your life. That's what we're looking to do. Excellent. So this brand is here to stay. We this all is the beginning of plenty more conversations to have. And I can't wait for some of these. How about BBS selecting a beer for private labeling? That could work. We're all for it. We're all for it. Can I read? Can I read the Do it as we can get out of the house. Yes. <laughs> if we, if we ever get, if they ever let us out of our houses, okay. my God, right? Um, okay. This is, this is kind of a cool story. Joe Lewis's mother gave him a quarter for violin lessons that he instead used to pay for boxing lessons and to compete in the Golden Gloves amateur boxing tournaments. It was her unintentional investment that led Joe to becoming one of modern history's most celebrated world heavyweight champions and the first African-American national hero. To honor his legacy and his mother's sacrifice, one dollar from each bottle of Joe Lewis bourbon sold will go to support community athletic boxing programs to inspire a new generation of champions. Joe Lewis, champion of them, of them all, is an authentic American small batch handcrafted straight bourbon whiskey deserving of the title. It is big and bold with herbal notes mixed with baking spices, cedar, and cocoa. The sweetness of a high corn mash spars with hot spices and wood tannins for a knockout finish. Joe Lewis bourbon is distilled in the breathtaking Blue Ridge Mountains from the finest ingredients, locally sourced corn, wheat, and imported barley with the limestone rich water of Davis Valley, just over the Kentucky line in Southwest Georgia. Barrel aged a minimum of two years. And on that note, I want to say thank you so much for being a part of our first cocktail conversation. This has been fascinating and I've learned a ton more about Joe Lewis. It has been a pleasure to work with you guys and thank you, thank you for taking my advice. I know that when I first saw the bottle, I was like, there's no black people in that, but <laughs> I'm glad, you, I'm glad you took my advice and found an image that was diverse. We did not want to get on your bad side. Yeah. I mean, and the fact that you guys went back into the archives and were able to find this image speaks volumes of your character as a company and your intention as a brand. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. I can't wait for this to be distributed throughout the country. I can't wait for Bourbonites to have this in their collection. Hey, let your team know, let your people know that anytime somebody wants to give me a call. Oh, uh, I'm coming, I've been eyeing your shelf the entire time <laughs> you've been talking. So I'm coming up to Maine and we will have a dram or two. I'm, I'm anxious to meet you. Do it I summer. can't wait either. Um, to the bourbonites who have been on this call, thank you so much for participating in our first cocktail conversation. We will do this every, we actually will do this on I was Wednesday. Gonna say, but wait, there's more, right? You're going to do, you're going to start doing happy hours on Fridays yeah. at five. And yeah. then starting next week, 
in this time slot, it's like programming, in this time <laughs> slot, every Thursday at five, uh, Joe Lewis Bourbon, um, there'll be Joe Lewis Bourbon happy hours, of which all of you are invited, and Samara will be involved in that as she's available. And, uh, and we're probably going to be doing some, you know, a lot more together. So yeah, um, for sure. And yeah. especially being with the advisory board, of course, yeah. I've got a gazillion balls in the air, but I am glad to be a part of the team and glad to see the success of Joe Lewis Bourbon. Um, so yes, guys, our cocktail conversations will be every Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, it's probably going to be our podcasting schedule. Tomorrow kicks off our our happy hours. So make sure you've got your bottle selected for that, your cocktails made. You guys have every cocktail recipe I've ever created already through Mixology Monday. So grab those as well. And we're just going to keep this light. Like I said, we're using spirits to keep our spirits high because we are stuck in the house. And we can't really go out, but that doesn't need to get us down. Let's keep our community together. Let's keep our family together. And let's keep supporting the brand. So liquor stores are still open, except in the, like, the state-controlled areas or whatever. But um, <laughs> as long as the store is open, we can, we can survive this. So thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very cheers much. Everyone, I drank all of my samples, so but cheers anyhow. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Everybody have a great night. All, all right. right. Goodbye. Bye-bye now. <laughs>